Anyway, Charlotte's going to be uh, debunking herbal myths. And not only that, you will come away, I promise you, guaranteed, rock solid, ironclad, you will come away with practical clinical tips and insights that are practically applicable to your practice Monday morning, because uh, Charlotte always delivers on how can I improve my patient care with herbs? So uh, so here's Charlotte. Charlotte, maybe uh, just tell, give us a little sneak preview of your uh, second volume in your uh, book series, your, uh, that, the book you're working on, and then uh, jump into the material. Well, it's funny. So, um, you know, when COVID hit, you, you know, years ago, <laughs> I really got depressed from the situation at hand. I, I, I saw what was happening. No, I named it immediately. Nobody around me saw it. And gradually, of course, voices like Michael's and many others emerged. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, good. But the three things I had to do during that time was bump up my dark chocolate intake, start drinking green tea again, because I just needed something to lift my spirits. And the third thing I did is I started writing love letters to herbs. Mm. So um, to me, herbs have personalities and they interact with us. And so just bringing that relationship to life through letters of gratitude, um, mm. it's been so much fun. Wow. So that's what I've been putting together. That's Slow great. to sure. And uh, yeah, so I'm excited about it. So Charlotte, if you had to guess, were you sometime next year, two years, eight years, what, what, what do you think? I would love to say sometime next year would be great. Okay, well, that'd be great. Well, we will do a full book launch for you here. And, uh, and uh, we're, get, we're getting close to 3,000 students now, so we, we'd love to have all of them buy your book, uh, as I will, surely will. And uh, I'd like yeah. an autographed copy, just saying, just a, just a hum humble request. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I'm just checking on audio. Are, uh, can you look at your Zoom, the little microphone on the lower left, and click on the arrow? Is your podcast mic the thing that's on, or is it the built-in mic? On the computer. It looks like it's the built-in mic. Let me try. It sounds like it sounds like a laptop mic. Let me see what happened with the with the microphone. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Did it come? Oh, did it oh better? like like about forty times better. Nine day. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. No, it's that. all right. I just it, it sounded less than awesome, and you have a great. Right. Day. So yeah. I wanted to uh, hear all your awesomeness and yeah. sound quality. What's the point if nobody can hear you? Yeah, yeah, we heard it. It was just cheesy. Now it's fabulous. Right. Really okay, good, good, good. Awesome. All right, thanks, Sean. Okay. You ready for me to share my screen? All you. I just wanted to okay. give you. I wanted to be your opening act this morning. I hope I did. Let's okay. do it. Yes, I'm sure you did. I'm just <laughs> sad I missed the piano. Oh, oh, that's what I was referring to. Sorry, I'm pressing. Okay. Well, we've I got know. it recorded. So uh, thank you. Okay, here we go. You can see it all as well. Looks great. Awesome. And I'm assuming we're going to do questions at the end, Michael. Uh, that's up to you. You've got two hours. Okay. Uh, so, you know, okay. 15 after the so, hour and uh, just perfect. read right. through and you can decide whatever. Okay. You and maybe like a five minute break for tea You're, or whatnot. Oh, totally. You okay. get to all, all, right. all you, whatever, however you want yeah, to we'll take a little break at the hour mark, just to know we've got a little yeah. space there. Whatever okay. you like. And I just encourage folks, uh, you've got a special opportunity here with Charlotte. She's a brilliant clinician, uh, and uh, please put your questions in the Zoom chat. As you go along, don't be shy. Type as you go. Question pops into your head. Just start typing. And yes, please. whenever Charlotte feels like it, she will jump into the chat and answer questions as she would like or when she would like. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so digging for truth deconstructing herbal myths thank you for everybody for giving up a little you know part of your weekend to join us and have these conversations because you know i love michael's message of nature first drugs last and i actually had a pretty profound experience with some herbs last night that i'm gonna speak about as we move through the presentation um but yeah this just came out of like i said yesterday a need for, you know, justice, right? Plants can't talk. They just do what they do. We are in essence, their voices. And I mean, their uses really get misconstrued sometimes. And as much as we'd all love to think that we're beyond the propaganda and beyond, you know, the, the negative messaging, 
sometimes it just seeps in. And so this is my attempt to undo that. And I love this quote from Rosemary Gladstar, talking to plants is one way of talking directly to spirit. So um, just remember that plants, I, I had this fascinating um, lecture the other day that I attended about um, <laughs> Like what? What is anything really? You know, not to go to um, esoteric or just the bizarro land, but people were talking about how water really isn't H two O and air really isn't air. Like water is just water, air is air, and we can never break these things into their parts. They're the elementals, and and so it goes with our plants. You know, we we think we can figure something out. We think we know, but do we really? I mean, the energy of the person making the medicine is going into those plants, right? That's a factor that has nothing to do with the plant. Um, so, you know, I think if there's one word I could use that I felt throughout my entire herbal education is just, is very humbling because you can spend the rest of your life studying this and <laughs> not get very far. It's just a little drop in the bucket that you actually know. So I really want to encourage through this presentation, your personal relationship with the plants, because a lot of studies fail us, right? Like plants are so dynamic and alive. They're interacting with our bodies and, you know, in the end, we only heal one person at a time, right? And we don't know what is gonna bring that healing on. Could be a plant, could be something else, but studies don't really encapsulate that, right? So let's continue on here. And thank you, Rosemary Gladstar. She's you know one of the founding people of Western herbal medicine that really brought it all back. So the lies start with mixed messages. Herbs are like drugs, yet herbs do nothing. I think everybody on this call has encountered this, this complete contradiction, like it, it neutralizes itself. So it's like shouting, be careful and why bother in the same sentence. Herbs are not drugs and herbs are not food. They're therapeutic plants with targeted effects. The most common adverse reaction will express itself in the gastrointestinal tract or feeling off. But even this needs to be investigated as a potential healing reaction. Um, I had a fascinating experience with black cumin seed. So when black cumin seed came out, I, you know, added it to my protocol and um, was faced with the most terrific black cumin seed gas that any human being could ever encounter. I mean, it was not only cramping in my GI tract, but the smell, all of it was just over the top. I mean, we can all handle some toots. This was not gonna work out. So I played with the dose. I couldn't get it worked out. I set it aside. And then Albizia complex got reformulated. They took out the fever few. You know, this is our Medier product for the allergic physiology. And it's got albizia, bicol skullcap, which is also known as Chinese skullcap. It did have fever few, and now it has black cumin seed. Excuse my sniffles. So I was very anxious about transitioning to the new albizia complex because albizia complex had been such a lifeline for me over the years. I mean, truly like gave me a life worth living in many different ways because I do walk through the world with a sort of an overactive, um, dysregulated detoxification response. Okay. So I stockpiled Albizia complex and then I finally ran out and I was like, okay, I got to switch over to Allergco. So they changed the name of the product when they reformulated them. All right. So I get, get on Allergco. And I get, I don't get the gas anymore, but I get this horrible rash on my hand right here, the, my inner elbow and my leg. I say horrible rash. It wasn't that bad. The one on my hand was really red and scaly and concerning. Cause I was like, if this spreads, I'm in trouble. And then I had these two patches on my arm and my legs that were not as bad as the hand, but still concerning. Okay. 
So I went on and off allergic coat trying to do this dance, came off it during peak allergy season, like peak. Our house was covered in pine pollen. And I know people say that pine pollen isn't that allergic because it's so heavy, it falls out of the air. You could write your name on our counters because we're living in the mountains now. We keep the doors open all the time. It's lovely. And yet I was swimming in this pollen without my main tool that I've had. So then in late June, early July, I was faced with, I, I don't even know how to speak about things anymore because I'm really examining germ theory um, and breaking that apart. I, I got sick or had a detoxification experience, aches, mucus, you know, the whole, everything but a fever. During that process, the rashes went away and I thought, huh. What did my body just clear? Because I had talked to Michael about black human seed and his invitation to me was to go slowly. The body, it, you know, it's a, it's a spice, right? Like it's a gentle yet effective herbal remedy that shouldn't be so provoking. So clearly my body needed to regulate something that black human seed was inviting it into a new thing. That rash disappeared. Now I'm on a lurch co no rash at all, no gas at all, black cumin seed, great. I don't know that I'll ever take just the tablet because I have my Allergico, but I feel like my relationship has been very transformed with that herb, as well as something got deeply addressed in my own body, a layer, right? Layers get peeled back. And so I just really want to say here that when we're dealing with, with herbs and we have these responses, we all have to dial into the nuance of, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Like, where, where do I need to go from here? What's the dance that I need to do with this herb? Um, and not be scared of it. So I know that was a long story. I hope somebody got a nugget out of something in that. Um, but, you know, this is something that will show up in your own bodies. And I mean, you know, I've had people have adverse responses to just about everything, right? Why? That becomes the bigger question and what we do with it. Do we do we take another fork in the road or do we stay the course in a different way? That's just what we all have to like get quiet about and figure out what direction to go. So herbs are recommended in the context of cost, tolerance, and compliance not safety concerns. Okay. I love that statement. Herbs are recommended in the context of cost tolerance and compliance, not safety concerns. But so many times that safety is at the top of the, the lot, the, the list, because we, we are focused on the wrong things, right? Like that's what the system wants us to do is be concerned about this and not that, but that is the thing that we really need to look at. It's just like people with their cell phones. Everybody loves their cell phones and they hate the cell towers. You can't have it both ways. You can't. If you love your cell phone, you have to love that cell tower. But we as human beings, we know that this technology is a problem but we're just faced with that cognitive dissonance of saying, oh my God, it's so convenient. How could I live without this? And, and here we are focused. Again, the most dangerous thing we have is that cell phone next to our brains. And yet we're focused on the cell tower. And it's the same thing with herbs. Our, our, our fear distorts what we should be concerned about thanks to the system at large. So again, each one of us has to do this internal work and investigation. So herb drug interactions, just a little ditty about this. So we're gonna have broad topics during this conversation and we're gonna have specific herbs we're gonna talk about just to give you the movement of the presentation. So much of the literature on herb drug interaction is bullshit. <laughs> is often prepared by those that have little training in botanical or nutritional medicine. This has led to assertions based on pharmacological theory without any corroboration from clinical experience or actual clinical evidence. Amen. 
Of the 30 herbs reviewed for herb drug interaction and herb nutrient and drug interactions, clinical implications and therapeutic strategies by Mitchell Stargrove, only four herbs have absolute concerns. Ephedra, ginkgo, stopping it before surgery, licorice, avoiding excessive doses with digoxin, St. John's wort, antivirals and immunosuppressants. Four. Okay. Of the 27 synthetic nutrients studied, 19 are of concern. I'm not going to read all of this. You're going to get this presentation. You'll have this as a reference. This is the perfect argument for whole food, standard process, nutrition, and whole plants, herb preparations, right? Like we can all get this. And it goes on and on. So that's four interactions for herbs and 19 interactions for synthetic nutrients. So what the hell are we even doing? All right, so let's kick it off here with, is ginkgo a blood thinner? Potential interaction of ginkgo biloba leaf with antiplatelet or anticoagulant, anticoagulant drugs. What is the evidence? So this is an article written by Carrie Bone. Happy to forward it to Michael so you can have it too. And here's the abstract. Some writers hold the view that the combination of ginkgo with anticoagulant or antiplatelet drugs represents a serious health risk. Such concerns are largely based on the assumption that ginkgo has clinically relevant antiplatelet activity, as well as accounts of bleeding episodes associated with ginkgo consumption. To investigate whether these bleeding episodes have a pharmacodynamic idiosyncratic or coincidental basis, a review of controlled clinical studies and case reports was undertaken. Results from controlled studies consistently indicate that ginkgo does not significantly impact hemostasis or nor adversely affect the safety of co-administered aspirin or warfarin. Most of these studies were undertaken using this specific kind of ginkgo, a well-defined extract, in contrast, this extract has not generally been implicated in the case reports. In general, the quality of these case reports is low. Nevertheless, the possibility of an idiosyncratic bleeding event due to ginkgo use cannot be excluded on the available information. However, there is scant information from case reports or control trials to support the suggestion that ginkgo potentiates the effects of anticoagulant or antiplatelet drugs. Such high level safety concerns for this herb are deemed to be unsupported by currently available evidence. Yes. So I got introduced to this um, early on in my herbal education because one of my teachers, Kevin Spellman, had an elderly patient that was on a blood thinner, but very concerned about mental and cognitive health. She came from a family of a lot of dementia, Alzheimer's and all that. She wanted to be on ginkgo. She just believed in the plan. And Kevin was like, okay, let's, you know, go get the DNR test to make sure that, you know, we can co-regulate the, the uh, blood thinning drug with the ginkgo. Zero problem whatsoever. And that was the first time that he kind of cocked his head and went, are we, are, is ginkgo a blood thinner? And then of course, Carrie Bone came on board with this article and not so much. So there's no evidence from controlled studies that normal doses of ginkgo or similar extracts have impacts on hemostasis. Earlier studies using high doses or isolated ginkalides have been inappropriately extrapolated to the normal use of this particular extract. In particular, the fact that the ginkalides are PAF, so that's platelet um, activating factor antagonists has falsely created the impression that this extract is a clinically active antiplatelet agent. Later research does not support such an impression. In terms of a potential herb drug interaction, four small controlled studies found no additional impact on hemostasis when this extract was combined with either aspirin or warfarin. So here we are, right? Conclusion continued. These results from controlled studies appear to be at odds with the 21 case reports published between 1996 and 2005, which describe adverse bleeding events in connection with the consumption of ginkgo. The ginkgo products were generally poorly described. That's so common. This extract was implicated 
in one of these cases, and it is possible that other components excluded from this extract may increase the bleeding risk. However, given the low quality of the case reports, it is also possible that the use of ginkgo is incidental to the bleeding episode. This latter possibility is supported by a database study involving a large number of patient observations where it was found that ingestion of ginkgo did not increase the likelihood of a bleeding event. Nevertheless, these case reports may still represent an idiosyncratic reaction to ginkgo, but more careful data collection is required to establish this. In terms of the potential for ginkgo to interact adversely with anticoagulant and antiplatelet drugs, there is little evidence from case reports to support this possibility. So, you know, complete lack of solid evidence that this is the way ginkgo is working. So what is ginkgo doing? There's a nice little picture of the red blood cells squeezing into tight spaces. We normally think of deforming as a bad thing, but if you're a red blood cell and you need to be getting into those tight spaces, voila, ginkgo improves red blood cell deformability. That's not a blood thinning activity. That's a healthier, more flexible red blood cell. And those are all of the other actions associated with ginkgo. Um, let's see here. All right. So ginkgo is really supporting microvascular circulation. So if you are familiar with the Medier product line, ginkgo is definitely an herb you can get on your, your own and either, I mean, as a simple, right? Just alone in either a tablet or we have a liquid available. It's also found in a number of other products. The two that stand out for me in this conversation are GoTo Cola Complex, where ginkgo is combined with GoTo Cola and grapeseed extract. And then also, um, gosh, used to be called a different name, Vascular Care Complex, which supports venous blood flow in the body. So good lymphatic support, good for soft tissue injuries and healing, good for squirmy legs that vascular care support. You know, people who get in bed at night and they've got that, you know, squirm feeling could be, uh, you know, just blood not moving on that lower half of the body. That vascular care complex can help and ginkgo's in there. So this is where it shines. And I gotta tell you, the more I study the human body and how it functions, our health is in our capillary beds. That's where it resides is in these like kind of like watersheds in the body where the blood is sort of the, you know, pooling and moving very, very slowly. And it's peripheral, our hands, our feet, our heads, right, are all peripheral parts of the body. That's where our health comes from. And so it's just something to think about, everybody should be on this five point dietary plan for the sake of the kidneys, the liver, all the tissues, the eyes, all the tissues getting nourished by this microvascular piece, nutrients in, toxins out. So you're gonna do that by boosting your dietary nitrate intake with beets, beta food from standard process, increase cocoa intake, that's a fun one, Increase berry anthocyanin intake. So, you know, I will definitely go to my grave taking bilberry. I absolutely love Mediherb's bilberry product is one of the most high vibe. To me, it's sort of like the chlorophyll complex of the standard process line. Like when you pick up the bottle, it's just like vibrating with vitality. I actually dump the capsule in water and drink the magenta water. That's how I like taking my bilberry, but also eat your berries. Raw crushed garlic, we know that's great. And increasing herbs and spices, green tea, turmeric, and ginger, right? Cooking and supplementing with all of these spices. And I just want to say, this is how you support heart health, is in the microvascular circulation. So <laughs> this is a separate lecture, but I'm studying right now with Dr. Tom Cowan, who has done a lot of work and in looking into the fact that the heart is not a pump. I don't have time to just take that deep dive, 
But it's just to say that it's not all about the um, the calcifications in our main arteries. Those are coming from things happening at the periphery. Like it's not blocking blood to the heart. There's collateral veins and arteries and blood flow vessels that appear when things get clogged. Again, we're focusing on the wrong thing. So if you're concerned about heart health and cardiovascular health, this is how you're going to support yourself. Making sure that blood flow is moving in the tight spaces.